What's up, YouTubers? <laughs> Today, I got a special treat for you. We finally get to actually build a project together. Now, I spent the last like three weeks shooting videos on how to stick weld without really doing any kind of project. Well, that was all leading up to this starter project. And I wouldn't really call it a starter project, but I think you'll understand what I'm talking about when you see. So very common, you the thing you might need to do is to weld a D-ring like this on maybe a trailer for a tie down or maybe on the back of a piece of equipment for a tie down or just to strap something to it. These are available at your tractor supply store and farm and fleet if you got them. That's what we got up here. Same thing with these hooks. You can put chain through them to hold something. You could use a strap on them, any number of things. Well, this is something that takes a little bit more skill to weld, a little bit more thought process. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Something with some liability that's very useful for your average person. So let's get into it. So let's talk about these hooks first. This could be something that you could weld onto a trailer to loop chain through to chain down equipment with a binder if you wanted. It could be on the back of an equipment or tow truck to hold chains. Any number of uses, very handy thing to put on something. Now this one claims to be forged. It does appear to be forged. If you look at this parting line, how wide that is, very good indication that it's a forged part. If it had a very fine line then it would likely be cast. Now this is labeled as 3 8 G7. G7 I believe is referring to a chain specification. So 3 8 is referring to the link size. So the oval link is 3 8 thick. So that's a pretty heavy duty chain. I would assume this would meet whatever strength requirements for that particular chain. I mean, let's be honest. This thing's so thick and beefy that you're not going to just peel this open before the chain likely fails. The more likely scenario is you'll rip the welds off of this, off of something, and that'll be your failure, which is kind of the point I'm doing of this, doing this video is to teach you guys how to weld these safely. Now, the biggest thing that you want to concern yourself with is proper prep. Now, you don't want to just set this on here and then go to town and just weld it right on something. You want to prep your material. So when you look at this, I buff the sides, the ends. I also put a little bit more of a bevel on it. One of the reasons for that is if you look here, if I can get this positioned, <laughs> there we go. This is an eighth inch rod. If you have this thing straight up without an additional bevel, if I can get this to focus, see where that rod is? You're not gonna get anywhere near down where it should be. So another way you can do it rather than using eighth inch, look how much further that gets in there. A fair amount. So if your prep consists of a little bit better bevel, so this is beveled ever so slightly more. Oh, wrong end of the rod. I'm getting at least halfway in. That should be in the ballpark of what I want. Now, if it's a real big concern on strength, say you're welding this to, I don't know, three quarter inch steel, you're gonna wanna leave a gap in there where you have a slight gap and you tack it with a gap and then weld it. The reason is it gives you more access to weld it further in. Now, this is only quarter inch plate. Ideally, a weld size only needs to be as big as the thinnest plate. So in the case of this, we would only really need a two pass weld on this to meet that. But I'm actually gonna do probably a three pass weld. The reason being is that this is pretty thin plate to be welding this to. Most of you out there would probably be welding this hook to three eighths or half inch. So in that case, you wanna weld this thing out with at least three, four passes. So that's what we're gonna do because it's better 
simulation of what you're going to do in real life. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to tack it. I prefer to tack on the top and run really hot to get this thing fused in. Then I run a pass on both sides and then I grind the top to where my next pass I can weld around it and the bottom. The reason is, is that all that torque that may be on this, it's going to fail at this point more so than any other point. So by grinding that initial tack out and then welding around it, that will give you a lot more potential strength. The other thing I'll mention before we get started is, and, and I hopefully won't offend any of you, this is not a job for short circuit MIG. So if you have a 140 amp wire welder or even maybe even a 180 amp wire welder, this is not something you should be welding with the short circuit MIG wire process. This is something that you can use flux core wire to weld and you can stick weld and of course you could TIG weld these, but do not use short circuit short arc MIG. And the reason is, is that short arc MIG on this thick of material on a forging and then to say three eighths plate, you're gonna have zero, repeat with me, zero penetration and it will rip off. And in the event that you don't believe me, I will upload pictures right now. So what we have here is a D-ring that was welded to a shipping container that failed upon picking it up. Now I apologize for the quality of these pictures. They were taken from a video a while ago. So this is a 3 8 thick plate, so it's significantly thicker than the D-ring that I welded in this video later. And you can see that the weld essentially didn't penetrate at all into the root, and it barely penetrated into anything on the plate it was welded to. Now this was welded with the short circuit MIG process, and the material prep was probably not prepped at all, so they welded over mill scale. And that's very common with short circuit MIG on mill scale on thick plate. It just doesn't penetrate anything. And then upon stressing it, it breaks off. This isn't just limited to D rings. It can be anything like these hooks that I'm welding that are super thick. The MIG process, a short arc MIG is realistically only capable of welding up to a bit over quarter inch thick like 5 sixteenths or so, 3 eighths thick steel is beyond the range of the short circuit process. In order with wire welding to weld as thick as 3 eighths, you would need to switch to either gas shielded flux core wire or dual shield as it's called, straight flux core wire, or use spray arc where you use very high settings in a special gas mixture in order to get increased penetration on thick metal. I'm not putting this up here to scare you guys. I'm just informing you on what the limitations are of certain processes so that you're better educated. Now the D-rings in this video that we weld later, those are capable of being welded with a short circuit MIG welder because it's quarter inch thick plate. It still would be smarter to weld it with flux core wire in that machine because of the increase in penetration. However, the hooks that we're gonna be welding in this video are not capable of being safely welded with short circuit MIG in my opinion. So I would not weld these on something with that process. The risk of uh, poor penetration is just too great. So let's get back to the video. So I got a 330 second rod. I'm gonna run it a little bit on the high side at 105 amps. The reason is I'm just doing a tack. I need this sucker to melt some stuff into burn in hot on this tack. I don't need a weak tack on this. So I'm holding it down here. I'm going to tack it. Nice tack there. You can see it pulled it up a little bit. That's okay, that little bit of gap will just give us a better access to get our rod in there. So now, I'm gonna slightly bend this up very little. You wanna be careful, you'll break it. All right, now I'm gonna tack it down on this corner. Now let's take a look at this angle to see what we're dealing with here. 
See how far that rod can get in there? Literally to the root. That's what we want. Now you notice how this thing is leaning a bit this way. That's okay. When I put in this root pass on this side, this thing's gonna bend right over, which will give me a little bit more access on this side that I can weld that all the way through. Now again, this is far thicker than our plate. And ideally, we wouldn't really want much thicker of a weld than this quarter inch. But I'm testing this, or we're doing this together, assuming thicker plate. So let me grab, I'm going to grab a fresh hole rod. The reason is, is that I think that's not enough to fill that in. But I'll go grab a rod and then we'll weld this out. Now we're in a flat position. You can see that it's going to be kind of tough to get it in here. We're going to have to go right level with the plate. It's going to be pretty difficult. If you can position it, like obviously I could weld it like this very easily, but is this a you know accurate representation of what you would face? Probably not. You'd probably either be welding this in a vertical up position or in a flat position. So that's how I'm going to weld it. My rod angle is going to be very flat. I'm going to be running at, uh, we'll try 105 amps and see how that works, but, uh, which is pretty hot. But again, we're welding a very thick chunk of steel. So I'm going to attempt to run this with my head way flat down and let's see how it goes. Alright, if you look at that, it's not too bad. There's a little bit, I wouldn't call it a cold toe, but didn't quite wet out on the top edge. There's still some slag in there too I'll have to clean out, but I'm going to wire wheel this. You're not going to get very good slag peel when you're welding inside of something like this. It's just not going to work like that because the flux gets pinched in there. So anyways, let me wire wheel this, and as you can see, it did pull it over slightly. Based on what I'm seeing, I think I'm gonna run the second pass on this side and then move over and run it on this side. I think it'll work better. So let's take a look at what we got here. Cleaned up real nice. You can see we no longer had an issue with it wetting into this forged part which a lot of that's simply due to the fact that this was heated up. We have our tack still there, tack still there. So at this point, our hook is virtually straight. I mean, still has a little bit of a cant, but that's all right. Part of that is this plate is actually starting to warp up. You can see that. So that's realistically why it's still a little bit far from straight. I'm going to go in and clean that with the brush best I can. Same settings, we're going to run 105 amps, 332, and we're going to weld two passes. And then at that point, I think I'm going to go in and we're going to touch up the tack on end and we're going to do another one. Now you're going to look here, we have a problem. Now I did this on purpose to show you what can happen if you don't run hot enough. You don't get your rod angle right. Essentially the weld deposited just on the bottom plate and not the top. 
So the question is, how do you fix this? Well, a lot of guys would just weld right over the top of that. That's not the best way. I'm going to show you how to fix it. So there's a number of ways that you can deal with this. For my case, I'm going to clamp this down to my table. I'm going to use an angle grinder and I'm just going to put a slight bevel and clean that out in there. And then I'm going to weld over the top. Won't be any big issue. Now, if I had been pushing more rod in while I'm moving to deposit more metal, it would have bridged the gap a lot better. If I would have upped my amperage uh, to 100, maybe 510 back where I was because I had dropped it a little bit, that would have also helped. So let's uh, get this cleaned up. See how we got that all cleaned out? Now that won't really be any big issue to uh, weld over now. All the slag that might have been in there is all gone. So let's grab a rod and let's go over it. Don't mind the spatter, that'll all clean off. As you can see, filled that in and we didn't just weld over that defect. I know that that's going to be strong now. So now I'm going to go back. I'm just going to clean up some of the spatter. I'm going to grind into this tack a little bit just to recess that in. Same thing over here. The reason is, is that I'm going to start slightly up here, weld all the way around the corner and end slightly on this side. Then I'm going to restart here, weld all the way around the same way. Now we're going to stick with 332 here. So we're going to do two more passes with 332 and then it's a wrap. Now you want to let this cool between passes a decent amount. I'm going to give this a little bit more time. So let's take a look at what we got. Still a little hot. I cleaned up most of the spatter. A lot of the spatter was simply because I couldn't get my hands positioned right and the art gap got a little too long. But I started down here, wrapped it around, ended. Started up here, wrapped it around, and ended. This is about what you should be shooting for for these hooks. Now, this is assuming you're welding this on, I don't know, three eighths or three quarter inch up to three quarter inch plate. You want to do, I think I did four passes. That's, or maybe five passes I did. That's what you want to do. Now, if it's quarter inch plate, like you can see how much this warped. And that's simply because of the number of passes that are put on it as it shrinks, the weld pulls up. That wouldn't happen on three-eighths or thicker plate, but on quarter, you could probably just do a simple three-pass weld. You also have the option, I use three thirty-second rods, okay? You could use eighth-inch rods. I'd still recommend a three thirty-second for your first pass, but you could easily do this in three passes where you use a three thirty-second for the first and then two eighth-inch passes for the second and third and be done. Um, for demonstration purposes, I think it worked better doing the smaller rods. Um, you also find that the smaller rods, like I said, are far easier to get in. 
but you want to wrap the ends because that's where all the stress is. When this thing, if it gets pulled, it's going to try and open this hook and pull up here. You don't want to leave that unwelded. You want to, and preferably do like I did where you wrap the weld right around the corner. Same thing up here. You want to wrap that around the corner of there so that it's strong. Hopefully all of this makes sense. And, you know, again, you could probably get by and never have this fail with a single pass of 532nd or even 8th inch 7018. But, like, this is something with some liability. I mean, the liability kind of lands on yourself. And, you know, do you really want to cut corners on something like this? My answer is no. That's why I showed you the way that I would do it. This really isn't so much a absolute, this is how you have to do it. It's just, this is how I personally do it. When you get in a rhythm, it actually goes pretty fast. I know it probably seemed like I was doing a lot of passes and a lot of cleaning for nothing. But realistically, once you get in a groove of this, to say I have four or five of them, it really doesn't take that long to weld these on. You know, especially because I wire wheel every pass rather than using hand tools. I mean, there's a lot of things I can do to save time. Um, not to mention, I'm worried more concerned about if you're seeing what I'm seeing type stuff. So that's a lot of time wasted too. But like I said, once you get the hang of this, this really isn't that hard. And I know for a fact that this will never fail and rip off this plate. I mean, it's just, it's impossible. Something else would break or this whole metal would tear off. So now let's talk about D-rings. All right, so we covered the hooks. I showed you a bunch of ways you could do that. Let's talk about D-rings. Now, these are weld-on D-rings. They do have bolt-on ones, but we're not going to talk about those because obviously I'm teaching you how to weld these. So these have a rating on them. This is the braking strength. 12,000 pounds. The actual rated low to this is probably only like 2,000, 3,000 pounds. These shouldn't really be used to uh, support human weight as the packaging probably said for these, which basically means don't lift any liability with it. Uh, these would be common to weld on a trailer for your tie downs and stuff. Very handy for that. So there's a couple things you want to concern yourself with. Um, one is you want to prep this stuff. So you can see here where it's just the, appears to be a forged loop. There we go, focus. It comes with the scale on it, buff all of that off. The ends, the side here. The inside doesn't matter as much because we're not going to be able to get a weld in there anyways, but you can buff that too but you want to prep it. Now, there's a lot of ways to weld these. Obviously, you want to make sure your D-ring is on it before you go and tack it up, but for the sake of this, I'm not going to put it on there so you can see. Now, you have a ton of options. You can weld it with eighth inch rod. You can weld it with 332nd. The minimum number of passes that you're going to have to do on this relates to how thick this is, which is about quarter inch, and your base material. Being that it's quarter inch, I'm going to say the minimum number of passes for this, if you're running 332 rods, 7018s is going to be three passes each side. If you're running eighth, you could probably get it done in two. If your second pass, you do a bit of a weave. So... You know, there's, there's all sorts of options. Now, one of the things I want to show you, this comes with like a little bit of a gap, like a chamfer on there, which that's fine. But getting, you know, for flux core wire, you could definitely get in there. But even with a 332 rod, you're going to end up having the same problem that I had with this guy, where you're just not going to get the the molten puddle in there, especially welding it horizontal like this, it's going to tend to want to stick to the plate and not this. So one option you do have is to actually come back and grind this bevel at a more open angle just so that you can for sure get penetration in there. That's an option. Like if this is put in some place where you have very limited access and the weld can't be very much wider than what this is, 
you may need to bevel it out wider in order to get the welds the thickness of the weld nugget that matches this without being you know far out on the plate now realistically in most cases how far the weld is off of this doesn't really matter because say it's on a trailer so that's not a huge deal it's just something to think of what i'm gonna do i'm gonna do since this is two different set up for two different ways i'm gonna weld one with eighth inch and one with 332nd now you want to tack and preferably weld the corners of this not just the face of it so you want to round the corners with your weld i'll just mention how i would do that and i'll demonstrate it as well in the video i'll strike my arc over here and then literally weld all the way down and then turn the corner and weld it I will tack it first, but by doing a continuous weld in that manner, I'm going to have a, a much stronger weld than if I just ran a bead in the front and then just left the tacks because everything's going to be nice and hot and fused together better. But yeah, so let's get started. All right, so I'm going to tack this at 105 amps with 332nd 7018s. We're going to be running a bit aggressive on the amperage for this, and the reason is, is that I want this tack to be hot so it actually fuses in with penetration. Hmm. Oh, I see what's going on. Got a bad ground. I was wondering why that thing wouldn't start sitting there on flux. All right, so got the tack on end, tack on end, tack, tack, looking good. I'll weld this side at about 100 amps with three passes of 332nd, and then the other side I'll try and do in two passes of eighth. All right, I switched over to eighth inch rod. I'm gonna run, we'll see 130 amps. I'm gonna let this cool a lot more. And while it's kind of cooling, I'll just give you guys a couple more tips. So normally when I weld something like this, I'm not sitting down on a chair with a camera above me. So I tend to stand over it. And then I would weld like this with kind of like my head over it. It's so much easier. Like if you look at my wrist position, if I start right here with the rod, it's very easy with very minimal wrist movement to weld this whole thing out. When you're sitting down, I have to move my wrist from like here all the way over to here. And that's why like you probably saw when I got to this point, rather than bringing my arm all the way here to try and maintain that angle, I had a slight push angle. And 7018, you can have a slight push angle for something like this at the end of a weld. 
and it will work. With 6013, if you try that, you're just going to entrap slag in it. With this, it does work. But again, you know, it's far easier to stand over it. And like I said, with very minimal wrist movement, weld the whole thing versus, you know, this whole ordeal. So always be mindful of that. Like if, if the more comfortable you are, the better your welds are going to turn out. There's, there's no doubt about that. So you want to be comfortable and be in a position that's advantageous to putting down good welds. The other thing I want to mention too, and I sort of touched this before, with stuff like this, I find that a lot of people weld without enough amperage. And when you weld a bead on plate at say 120 amps with eighth inch rod like I got here, that's fine, like for practice, not an issue. When you're welding on stuff like this that really needs strength, like your, your penetration needs to be there. And if I were to try and weld this at, you know, 90 amps with a 332, you're not going to get the same penetration as 100 to 105. So my recommendation is to run hotter on that initial pass to make sure that you have fusion. The other thing too, and I've mentioned this in my uh, previous videos to a certain extent, but when I'm welding this, I'm putting pressure on the rod and I'm kind of feeding it in. And the best way I could describe that is if you take like a hot frying pan and then take a crayon or a hot melt glue stick and you push it and it'll melt off slowly. Like you can feel pressure on that glue stick and it will melt and it slowly. That's the kind of pressure you want is like melting a crayon on something hot. Now, if you really jam that crayon in there too hard, it's probably going to quench the metal that's hot and then it's going to stop melting. So you don't want that. You want to slowly push it to where you can just feel it kind of slowly melting off. And that becomes very important. When you use smaller rods and are trying to fill up a gap like was underneath here, the issue is if you don't put that pressure and feed it in while we'll, we'll, moving forward slowly, the weld is essentially not going to fill up. You're not going to deposit enough metal. And then the weld will either stick to the top piece here or the plate. And you saw that earlier in the video with this hook where the weld only deposit on the flat plate, and not the hook for part of it. That's you got to get that pressure on there and feed that puddle a little bit. I mean, there is a limit. It's not like you can bridge a, you know, a half inch gap in one pass with an eighth inch rod by keep f feeding it. At some point, the puddle's just going to lose stability and control all of that fun stuff. But I think you get what I'm saying. Like if you're filling a gap, you need to put some pressure and feed some rod in there, like on something like this D ring, or you're just going to have issues where it's not going to bridge over both pieces and, and fuse them. Well, I think this is cool enough. Still a little bit hot, but not too bad. So again, I'm running uh, 130 amps on a single uh, pass eighth inch 7018. We'll do one pass and then probably a second and see how it goes. So this picture kind of shows you what you should be looking for. Now this isn't the same weld, this is from a different video, but it still shows the molten eye that you should be dragging along to tie in everything. All right, so let's take a look. This side we did two passes with 7018 eighth inch, 130 amps for the first, 125 for the second pass. I lowered it a little bit, I didn't mention that. We have our whole side wrapped all the way down. 
that's looking pretty good. Nice smooth run up front. And then we have this side completely wrapped around really nice as well. For a two pass weld, this is about what you wanna be aiming for. Sure, if I ran a little bit straighter, it'd be a little bit visually more appealing, but that's looking pretty good. This is what you wanna be aiming for. You can tell that the weld, if you look at how far it comes out, does not come out as far as the three pass 332nd. I'll hold it up. It's close, but not quite. Realistically, I would say that this weld size, the actual throat depth, is pretty close, probably dead on to quarter inch due to the two passes, so we should be fine. You wanna aim for whatever the thinnest piece to have your weld that size, so we're pretty close here. I personally would have ran a single pass of uh, 332 and then maybe two passes of uh, 7018 and went a little bit faster so it didn't deposit as much metal. That pass I had to go real slow to, to make sure I had enough metal down there. Now this side, which was three passes of 332nd, we were running about 100 amps, 105 amps for the tack. Wrapped it around the corner there pretty decent. Same deal over here, looking real good. I don't really see any undercut on either one of them, which is what you wanna be worried about too. If you undercut this whole top part of this, you're gonna lose strength, so you definitely don't want that. The finished weld on this, I would say, is probably very, very slightly over quarter inch thick because you have to remember that first pass that I ran did not deposit anywhere near the amount of metal that the eighth inch did, so our finished weld is probably barely over this. So again, very acceptable as well. You can see I didn't accidentally weld the D-ring to it, so that's a plus. And I didn't forget to put the D-ring in there. True story, I actually welded one of these on a trailer some night that I was super tired, wasn't paying attention. I literally had a pass on both sides and then realized the D-ring wasn't even in it. So, whoops, we all have idiotic moments. So, well, I guess let's finish this up and just do an overview. So to cap this video off, I'll do a real quick uh, overview. You know, I learned a lot. I learned that uh, body position matters a lot. Like the, my preferred method to weld these where I'm standing over them is far easier than sitting in a chair and trying to manipulate the wrist. It's just so much harder, especially, you know, I got carpal tunnel and all sorts of wrist problems. You probably do too. Not the most fun. I learned there's multiple ways to do a project like this. The key thing always is though, you want adequate weld thickness, your throat depth, and then you also want to make sure you're running hot enough and you want to make sure that you avoid undercut, wrap your corners, do what you can. It's called attention to detail. You know, critical stuff, not that this is going on a nuclear reactor or anything, but critical stuff like this, which is far more liability than just say sheet metal on a car, you want to be confident that you know what you're doing and part of that is, is that practice, and the other part is, you make a screw up, fix it. You saw me, I made a couple mistakes, and for the most part, I fixed them. That's called attention to detail. As long as you have attention to detail, you're not gonna find projects like this any harder. And of course, you know, you could, you could surely take a 532nd 7018 and just run a single pass on this and call it good, and it'll probably never fail, you're right. But, you know, something like this, if it's worth doing, do it right. You know, it doesn't really take that much longer to do it right. So that's kind of my thought. Like I said, this isn't a, uh, exact how to do it. It's how I did it and different ways you could do it. So take the information and form your own opinion. Anyways, thanks for sticking around. I appreciate it. Till next time.